The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... Please note, the new number is... We terraform the land to make it suitable for our needs. And through the act of that, we literally decimate all the animals in that land and we repel them from that area. So much so that most of them, if not 40% of them, end up dying just from us taking their land. Because we took away their home entirely. And so we, 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 I find like there's often this, this misconceived notion that just, just the act of not eating something is like protecting it. When the reality is just the act of being a part of a domesticated civilization, which is establishing colonies across land, is destroying and decimating animals, right? So it's like, how are we going to stop that? Like, how do you mitigate that? That's really hard. That's when you get like more denser and denser populations, right? Because everyone's like, oh, we got to stay close together. Otherwise, we're going to keep impacting the animals. Well, we get to this point where we're like too close together and we're just constantly impacting ourselves so we create some sort of, uh, some series or some list of unfortunate events, such as disagreements and cult cultural quarrels within the civilization or colony itself. So then we get to this point where it's like, we have divergence, right? We have a split within the colony and then there's a new, a new colony that's went off and established, right? Um, uh, which is kind of a problem. And I know we're supposed to like top off as like a, as like humanity allegedly, allegedly, right? Cause I, I, I can't prove this. Allegedly we're supposed to talk, stop about 10 billion people, but we're already like eight and a half billion deep, right? So it's like, how are we to ensure that there's only going to be one and a half billion people born still, right? And then we're going to level out there at like 10 billion, right? Because it's like in the, the whole idea of that, right, is that people are still being born, right? Like, because there's no way, there's no way you could have, you know, 10 billion people, right, without people still being born because the lifespan of people. I feel like, you know, like I... I, I've observed that most most of the time Eastern cultures, like where in India specifically, we have Hinduism, we have Jainism, which kind of restricts if you're truly following the religion. Like Hinduism is kind of divided into Shaivism and Vaishnavism. So Vaishnavism is you know like worshiping Vishnu, and Shaivism is worshiping Shiva as a figure. So depending on both the divisions, I've seen that most of the Vaishnavists are strictly vegetarian. Like they have vegetarian diet, but also you cannot eat onions and garlic because they grow under the crown or something like that. And I think even Jainists have that view of perception that you're not supposed to eat anything that grows under the crown. And I mean, they have extremist beliefs, Jainist people. They, they can't hurt stones. They can't hurt objects because they, I think they believe that everything is sentient in nature. So, you know, I feel like most of these, yeah, it's crazy. East, Eastern cultures have always been you know, uh, promoting vegetarianism. And like, I grew up all vegetarian, like till now I'm all vegetarian. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting experience because you're definitely limited. Like when you travel a lot, when you go to different countries, like it's crazy. Like even Southeastern um, countries, if you go, it's like, you know, there's so much meat, like you have to find like a pure vegetarian place. It's always very, very messy. And like, you know, you were saying uh, urban, I feel like urban planning, like domestication, and like all, all that stuff, it's been happening for so long. Like, like now we have come to a situation where Elon is like, we're gonna go to Mars and colonize another planet because we don't have space yeah. in this planet. Like how, like sometimes I keep on wondering if we really look into the abstract future, what if we fucking colonize the entire universe, dude? Like, you know, because it, it is a problem of just existence itself. Like how many humans can exist within one environment? We've definitely exhausted Earth. Now we're going to exhaust Mars. And then, I mean, what comes after that, you know? My intrigue with Mars is that it's like, how are we supposed to create it to be a habitable plane? When it's like, well, the whole idea with the, the current model of that, right, is that, well, we're in the safety bar, this buffer, right? We're at this perfect Goldilocks zone of distance from the sun. It's not too cold. It's not too hot, right? Well, then Mars, right? it will slowly be encompassed by that Goldilocks zone. But as in like, when, like, how are we supposed to start measuring that? For one, it's like my number one question, how do we measure when the Goldilocks zone is moving and at what rate is it moving? And not only that, but if the Goldilocks zone moves then we lose our planet, right? If it moves far enough, then it gets too hot, right? We lose our planet. 
then it's like we don't have earth so it's like even if we were try even if we were to try to colonize the entire system we'd just constantly be in this perpetual cycle of oh here's a mars is now the new new earth oh the next planet's now the new earth you know so on and so forth because it's like we're constantly losing that planet from the, from the sun destroying it until the sun is like you know destroyed everything like all it's about adaptation it's like you're going to mars now you have to you know like as you said you have to adapt to that that environment now let's say we go to yep. this you know we have to do the same but it's like we're yep. changing our dynamic of the human physiology and biology every time we you know maybe take turns and go to different planets it's it's crazy yep. like what do you think about transhumanism like this phenomena that you know let's say we're we're going ahead into the cyberspace versus reality infused together future like we have virtual reality which is how we're connected right now and and then again this particular reality like you're in your room I'm in my room right and so like when we think of future like do you think we're going to assimilate together with uh, virtual reality to complete exchange or do you think it's only going to be partial uh, i think that if that happens it would only be partial i don't think there's a way to like like for instance the whole like download consciousness right like i think that's impossible i i think if we can't measure consciousness i think if we are so incapable of measuring consciousness then we are most certainly incapable of trying to download it from a biological life form and upload it into a synthetic computer i don't think that's achievable and i don't think that would even be consciousness as we know it even if we were downloaded into a computer would it not just be downloading our memories and what we already had is what we were right and then would it not just be constantly playing this like kind of repetitive cycle of like here you are here's who you were well, here's what's going on inside the computer now because it's like how are we to know that we're actually going to be this sentient electric form that's able to go experience because it's like that's what the whole human experience is right it's like you can't taste without a tongue you can't hear without ears you can't see without eyes and like our cameras as eyeballs have been developing for like such a period of time so much longer than we've developing cameras ourselves right so much longer so that cameras even even the nicest of cameras don't seem to compare to your eye you know you ever take a picture of something with like the nicest camera you have available and then you look at that perspective with your eyes and say why is it that i can see that so much closer with my eyes it's because our eyes are so much more well defined so much much more redefined being a biological being which has been you know in a perpetual state of growth and development and refining the camera right because it's like throughout almost every being right or the whole idea is that we're trying to get a little better right because like adaptation the whole concept of evolution we're always evolving to get better so it's like there's no way in my opinion that we can just stop our evolutionary process long enough to say our cameras will catch up to our eyes i don't think that's ever going to happen and if we do achieve that i'll be really astounded because then we would have to have had figured out a way to stunt or stop ourselves from perpetually adapting and evolving into our environment and i don't think that's going to happen i think there's got to be a way for us to understand biological life better i think there's got to be a way to propel biological life better in my opinion just because if if our whole pursuit is to create and establish an entirely synthetic being right like so that way we could try to download our consciousness into it like i don't know how well that's going to work uh, i think we're just going to build a computer and that everybody else is going to see oh look there's a computer here and it's all robotic and it's moving and it's supposed to be this person right but how are we going to measure it's this person you know like what traits defined that person aside from the entire being of which they were you know like i don't think you we are who we are without the sensory input and organs of which we possess there's no way to be a human being in an electric life form I don't think so at least. And it's like a very philosophical and debatable thing. And I and obviously I would hope at some point maybe we could establish, you know, some form of electronics or AI which is particularly profound. But I still don't think it's ever going to be comparable to human consciousness. Let alone are we going to be going to be able to map out consciousness to such a T you could take someone's current data and information that they have and put it into an electric being and then them all of a sudden realize and dilute into that role of oh i have all these memories i was this person 
Well, it's like how, it's like you were that person, but now you're all electric. So now you can't sense the same, right? You can't interact with the world the same. You can't feel warm. You can't feel cold. <laughs> it's like, there's all these problems. It's, it's literally just take away everything from life, in my opinion. Like if I couldn't feel the weather, then why would I want to see the sunshine? Why would I want to go outside in the rain if I couldn't feel it on my skin? I don't think it would be fun. I think I wouldn't enjoy talking to people knowing that they don't have their own sensory organs and they can't make of it of what they will on their own will and accord. It would be kind of bothersome to know that everyone's got the same default mode of filtration like to, to the utmost degree through, through literal programming and computational input is the same default. <laughs> I think that would hurt everyone. <laughs> I feel like we've been going like so fast in terms of functional stuff in life. Like even in like sciences and philosophy or any discipline, we, we're always focused, you know, towards like kind of solving like the practicalities, the things that we know. So any kind of a priori knowledge within our environment and we always take in our data and we were always making things. But for some reason, we never, like in, in history till now, I think we've never solved any major metaphysical question. And it keeps like, yeah. we're creating robots, we're creating a virtual reality, augmented reality, but we have still no clue as to how, you yeah. know, this particular thing works here. And like, we're trying, yeah. like, I feel like we're trying to create perfect humans. I think that's like the main goal. If someone is able to create the perfect copy of themselves from, you know, like your nerves to your eyes to everything. I think that's like, you know, kind of the human egoistic goal to achieve that kind of, you know, like achievement that you're able to create another version of yourself completely, another human on your own. Yeah. Like we're going towards that, but we have no idea how we're gonna actually put you know, the software into that thing, because like the hardware is there, you know, we can build up robots and stuff, but how are you going to input this thing? When especially like, you know, and that's where altered states of consciousness come in. Like, you know, we don't even know what normal consciousness is. And we try to, you know, go into these altered consciousness states and it's, it's crazy. How can we simulate that? You know, that's kind of like the real question. I think if you were a robot, there's no way you could experience DMT. I feel like whatever consciousness is it's more or less related related to the fact that we can achieve these altered states with the being and form of which we have and i think that there's just the just the concept of like knowing that oh your dmt would now be computational right makes me think well how do you know you didn't preemptively program all this and that this isn't all synthetic now because i'm in a computer right that'd be the real question because like here right now we already know well, to my knowledge, I'm not a computer. So obviously something particularly ph ph phenomenal and interesting is happening when I go into altered states, something that we can't explain. So much so that it seems so important to everyone that we're all obsessed with the idea of it and we don't know how to communicate it. It's that big of a deal, you know? I think if we can communicate the concept of AI, right? I think we should focus on communicating the concept of Re using technology to recreate altered states of consciousness at least our perspectives within them you know like for instance like like the whole concept of like a music video right it's like you could conceptually if you did it right if it was drawn correctly you know if you put all the ratios right you could make dmt appearing fields show up on a screen it doesn't won't give you the experience of going through those fields it'll just show you what it looked like to that person subjectively and that's kind of like another thing that's like we would be missing, right? We'd have no art because it'd all be it'd all be like computer perfect. There'd be no there'd be no human perfection to it, you know. It wouldn't be the same. Like no, drawing wouldn't be the same. I don't think talking would be the same either, you know. It's like how would we talk? Would we just look at each other and then just send an email? You know what I mean? Like mentally, like gotcha, you know. Like what would it be like? We wouldn't be communicating with words. What would be the point? You know, like if, if we're all computers and we could all talk to each other in our heads and why would we even try to speak, you know, uh, like another another factor of consciousness just with, withdrawn entirely from the whole concept, you know, which is just like even more painful. Yeah. I think that's kind of like the joys of the human experience is you can go into an altered state, you can come back and you can communicate this profound insight and what you made of it 
in your own subjective consciousness from this subjective experience that was just for you, which no one else can experience right now, no matter how hard they try to recreate it, they won't go to the same space. They won't come out saying the same things. It's going to be different. Um, now, if it was a computer, I'd think, well, dang, now we can all experience the same thing. But now, just because we can experience the same thing doesn't mean it's going to be profound to everyone, now, is it? It's going to be profound to that one person who was meant to receive that one thing. But then it's like everyone else is going to be like, huh, that was pretty dull. That was, that was, that was overwhelming. Well, what's up with this overstimulation? You know, I can't make anything of this. You know, I like the whole idea of here we are. We're all biological. This is really confusing as it is just being biological. I think that's even funner. I've spent probably too much time in altered states. I'll put it that way. I was really fascinated with, with, with the Streisman podcast because I've been fascinated in DMT for a long period of time, probably too long. I'm a, so long, as a matter of fact, that I think it was my, because it's, it's been like a, a number of times, I'd say so far to my own writing, about 146, maybe 147 experiences, not particularly a blast off or having had gone to a different space, but having had attempted to take DMT and experience an altered state. <clears throat> The, about the last time I came back, all I could think, right, is that all the criteria within the DMT space has constantly been here in this perpetual motion, and we just never acknowledge it as that. We're all so caught up in the mundane that we can't say, wow, I'm sitting here surrounded by Euclidean geometry. Everywhere I go, there's only five shapes which construct my being and everyone else, and we can't think this to be profound, and I think it kind of is. Because if you go into like some sort of hyperbolic realm, like with like with DMT, all of a sudden there's a, there's a lot more going on. But it seems to be constructed of the same five lines, no matter what you do. Uh, these five lines I refer to is just the language of art, you know, like an arc, a dot, a horizontal, a diagonal, and a vertical. These are the only five lines you could draw, right? And every space you were to go to in an altered state, these are the only five lines you'll ever see. You could try as hard as you want. If you see a squiggly line, it's just a bunch of arcs put together, making a squiggly line. You know, like it doesn't really matter. There's only five shapes. And that to me, it should be a bigger question to us than what's happening between Euclidean and hyperbolic. Well, really it should be, why is it that there are these five shapes in hy hyperbolic space as much as there are in Euclidean space? And why are we not questioning this more? It seems important that the reality as we see it or as it appears is constructed with five shapes what is the significance of those five shapes and why is it that there are no other shapes you know this is something that bothers me and then we don't seem to question this we just seem to think oh wow this is a this is overwhelming this feels different this is particularly colorful and pretty we should go into this different state again well, i don't really think that's the case i think like streisman said it's not about going into it it's really about coming out of it and taking something out of it you know something that you could actually make out of it something that'll last you long enough that you can contemplate it long enough that you might figure it out you know you should, i think the whole idea with dmt and altered states is that we're kind of learning something more profound than what words can communicate and if that's the case i think it's got to be something pertaining to what the relativity between this space and the next one is and the only things i could see which are similar is just the shapes what things are constructed with now in my opinion these shapes could also be what constructs consciousness right this could just be or it could just be the fact that consciousness can only receive these five shapes there might be more shapes out there or more different lines we just can't perceive them with the consciousness of which our body allows us to have now that being said, that's relatively limiting, and it's it's limiting in the aspect that it takes away the what the the more or less spiritual side of it, right? Like the whole ethereal like reality of it. Like I always talk about this, but I feel like you know we're we're moving towards the space where we don't even know like half the things we're supposed to know by now. Like it's twenty twenty one. And we're still like so motivated towards uh, solving the functionalities and practicalities of life that we're not solving the main problem. 
which is, you know, like, why are we here? What is happening? You know, like every human just is like kind of like born into the simulation in a specific country, specific location, specific culture. And it's like they're being programmed throughout their entire life not to question the very first thing. Why am I here? It's, 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 it's very yeah. crazy to imagine, yeah. No, the thing is, for one to question, you know, it, sometimes it depends on the individual, right? Because it's like, I know myself throughout most of my childhood, I was basically told to sit down and listen. And then my problem was I didn't want to sit down and I couldn't listen because I was so caught up in questioning everything. And I was pretty bothered by the fact that nobody else was. And it's been like a, it's been a long time running like that. I remember uh, like, I believe I was in fifth grade and we were getting IQ tests because this is, and this is just in a, that one particular, particular class I was in because I was in like special ed and all because I didn't know what was going on. It was a very strange kiddo, you know, as you know, I'm all high functioning. And that wasn't something that was discovered until I was 19. I wasn't, I wasn't labeled or classified as high functioning or having autism until I was 19 years old. So when I was in fifth grade, I was like 11 or 12. And they gave me an IQ test. And I was there for like an hour and a half, about 90 minutes or so. And the whole time, I just would not stop asking this person giving me the test. What is this test? Why am I having it? Why are we all doing this? What is it for? And I, they told me literally every time, it doesn't matter. No, you have to take it. You have to answer these questions. It doesn't matter why you're taking this test. And I just kept telling them, but it does matter. And I want to know why. So they ended up giving up after like an hour and a half, two hours. They gave up because they just couldn't, couldn't stand sitting here being questioned for 90 minutes when they're supposed to be questioning me, right? And I'm supposed to be answering. So they, they gave me an awful IQ. It was awful. They tried saying I had an IQ of 57. And let's just, to, just to clarify, right? When you have an IQ that's lower than 86, that's to say that you can barely talk, right? But I, the whole time, right, I was just asking them all these many, many, many questions. So it's like when I turned 16, 17, I ended up getting an actual psychological evaluation. And when I, they said, oh, this is, I asked them, what is this test? They go, oh, this is an IQ test. I go, what's that? They go, oh, we're going to try and determine your intellectual quotient. They say, oh, we also have an EQ test for your emotional quotient. I go, oh, nice. This, this seems interesting. I'm, I'm willing to try this, right? So I was actually willing. It was like a, like a four or five days worth of testing. It was like a long period of time. A month. And it was about three hours a day, sometimes three and a half hours. And very different result, very different result. Um, uh, it was pretty baffling to me to think that we, like in a system, right, for schooling, that we could just try to tell people, we don't have to tell you why you're taking this test. All that matters is that you do it, right? Because that's pretty sheepish if you ask me. It's like, I don't think I want to do anything without knowing why, let alone take a test on something without knowing why. I'm a, so it's like, I took this test when I was 16 or 17, and the lady tried telling me I was at 137. And I was like, okay, that's different. It's a very different result than 57, I'm a, <clears throat> which was really funny. I'm a, so I found that your willingness to be programmed has a huge determining factor as to whether or not, or, or as to what your label is truly. How you communicate with others has such a dramatic impact in this space, that is that you could just ask someone questions and just their refusal to answer will determine whether or not you're a retard or not, which is kind of awful to me. And I didn't like that at all. Um, uh, but the thing is, all programming is different everywhere, which is particularly profound and astounding to me. And the thing is, we don't truly have an actual criteria about it. We, there's, a, there's a bunch of methods for conditioning the mind and that we've implored throughout all sorts of schooling and programming throughout long periods of time but the thing is at the end of the day consciousness is truly subjective right so how someone goes about using their consciousness is really up to them and their state of consciousness at that point in time has a huge impact on what they will say and how they'll use their consciousness the feeling of being stilled is probably one of the most profound feelings from dmt in my opinion Everyone, everyone tries to say that it's always like the pinnacle of it, right? It's always the, oh, I'm out of my body. I don't even feel my body. Whoa, that's like everything, right? Well, no, not really. All of a sudden feeling as if you're overwhelmingly still, like as if you've suddenly flipped a switch and now you're present. Now you're present. You said, I'm gonna stop thinking. I'm here. I'm actually here. And you could be there. And then 
all of a sudden hear this beautiful ringing and say, man, I just feel so still. I just want to lean back and close my eyes and then go to the most beautiful places because you were still, you know. I've seen so many people take DMT and think, oh, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not getting anywhere. I hear this ringing. I'm not getting anywhere, right? Because it's like this constant state of like, oh, I'm here in my being. It's not this constant state of I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to relax. I'm trying to let go. I don't want to be here. I'm aware of that. I'm trying to trying to be present somewhere else, you know? I don't really see that, you know? And when I do see that, it doesn't take those people much. It takes them like maybe one or two hits of DMT. Like I'd say maybe, you know, between seven and 15 milligrams. It doesn't take much for anyone. But now if you go into it saying like, oh, I'm really attached, I'm really grounded to this place, like I don't want to let go, then yeah, if you're going to go through like 30, 50 milligrams of DMT and you're like, well, I didn't really get anything out of it, you know? It's like, well, how much were you trying if you're just trying to stay here? Like as if you could just watch it, you know? Like you can't, you can't just stay here and watch it. Like you have to like say like, this is stronger than me. This is more overpowering than me. I have to let go and become a part of this if I want to live. You know, and then you do. You always come back. You always live because you said I was a part of that. Yeah. It's it's very interesting though. Like like I keep on imagining like our early years of childhood, like from like literally getting born to let's say three four years. You know, there's obviously consciousness there, but like we don't retrieve most of it. You know, the sensory motor stage where the child is just relying on its senses and you know mother is like the only object of desire like how psychology would claim it and like we don't necessarily always retrieve every single memory like even people with photographic or eidetic memory like I don't think anyone is able to map out their early years of existence you know which is a yeah. thing because the consciousness is being you know as I said it's being progress it's updating developing itself and then when we use you know like these altered states of consciousness later in life it's kind of like uh, the emergence of the unconscious and the consciousness at the same time. So it's like, I don't know, I've been thinking about this for some time. It seems as if, you know, like throughout psychology, there's obviously a very big emphasis on the word unconscious, you know, Freud and Lacan. They would say, you know, the unconscious is where the mystery actually is because we are conscious about the things that we know. And, you know, we pretty much have the functional idea of how consciousness works, but it is really the unconscious which kind of interferes with the consciousness and gives us these, you know, weird intuition or personal biases or any kind of, you know, language stuff. And, and you know, like it seems as if we, what happens with pharmacology or psychoactive pharmacology is that it enables the unconscious and the conscious to kind of exist at the same time. So, you know, we have like, even in dreams, you know, that's kind of what happens also in the dreams. One could say that you have your conscious state of mind existing within the dream so yeah you see towers and buildings the way they're supposed to be and and then you encounter you know some strange phenomena within your dream well it was not there it was definitely in the unconscious and it just surfaced you know throughout the dream so it seems as if altered states of consciousness are the very very conscious way of experiencing this tripped out um fact of you know our own existence that we, you know, the, that the altered state of consciousness, the life of the mind, streptamines, you know, take any, even caffeine, you know, they, they affect your brain in such a way that it, it seems as if you're aware most of the times of the things that you would not be aware of, right? So like on, in psychedelics, like, you know, if we, if we take psychedelics, we're like, oh, I didn't realize that about myself. That's why, you know, getting out of the trip is important. It's because, yeah, like you, you might have had like this meaningful, deeper experience but as soon as you're coming out you know it's 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 the coming out that kind of makes you realize of the state that you were already in like you know like it is a cause and effect thing like you know you only realize the effect when it has happened and, and the cause is apparent so like it, within psychedelic experience it seems as if you know like we're just playing with the chemistry and also with the very presence of mind itself like, you know, if you were to divide mind into conscious entity and unconscious entity, and we put some chemicals on top, and like all of these three things are conflating with each other, it's, it's, it's I think, the maximum, of, maximum play you can have with your own consciousness, right? Like, one thing to trip out and go to the space and live in Mars and have a, you know, dystopian kind of, but also utopian kind of reality, or you could just, you know, take DMT and experience it right, right here, right now. And, and also just get to know that it's all about, you know, your unconscious mind emerging and the message that it has to give you because it's always present. It's always encoding information, 
but we're just not aware of it all the time because that's how trauma works, right? Like you, you experience a traumatic event, X happens and then you're like, oh shit. But most of the things like the trauma is always there, like it's in your mind, but it's only going to surface itself when given the opportunity. So let's say someone has like a life surgery mind trip in a, in a traumatic headspace. He's obviously going to do some crazy shit because it was already there. Like, you know, you said intention, like it's always already there. Like it's in your deepest unconscious or conscious mind. You know, that's why they say with psychedelics that, oh yeah, you should not take psychedelics if you're, if you have a schizophrenic or bipolar or you know any of these people in in your family genetics because it's going to trigger it it's literally the same thing if anyone takes uh, uh such a special and, and holy compound i would say like dmt or lsc or any of these things and does some crazy shit it was already there it was already in their yeah. mind it was already always there it just you know it act, literally acted as a medicine and activated the real to the person that this is what has been there and this is what you were you know so uh, unoblivious to or like you just didn't see it so it's it's kind of interesting like I feel like you know it just all comes back to your you know deepest aspects of your mind like you know the unconscious w w which always emerges in these kind of experiences yeah having like the unconscious emerge on a psychoactive state is real um in a dramatic degree what's really crazy to me is to see how other animals could just be born and they already know a longer series of things than we do for instance, when we're born, we can't get up. We can't get up at all. We can't even lift up our necks. But when other animals are born, within a few hours, they stand up and they start walking, mm -hmm. which is really profound to me. It's like they already know, like he was born knowing how to walk and we we're born not knowing anything, um, which is very different as like animals. And I think it's kind of dramatic because there's even social creatures which have that, you know, like. For instance, like deer and elk, they're born and they can walk. And just like a lot of other animals, like elephants, for instance, like they're born and they already know how to walk. We're born and we have no idea. We don't even know how to crawl. We can't even achieve it. You know, it takes us literally months and then we learn because someone teaches us and gets us in that direction. And then we just start doing it. It takes us a lot longer. And I think that could just be because we're a lot more complex as an animal. But I also feel as if I think it makes these other animals more complex for them to just be born and to say, I know how to walk. I know where to go. I know what I eat. You know, that's really profound to me. You know, we don't know any of that. You know, that's what's so different about us. It's like, I feel like uh, that's also another factor of diet and diet controversy. It's just us as, an, as animals, what, like we've, we've never actually just came out knowing what we're going to eat. We've always just came out and been told what we have to eat and what we could eat we're never we never know you know we don't just say oh yeah like i i could just eat eucalyptus leaves all day bro and i'll be the happiest motherfucker around like that that never happens nobody just comes out saying i know i'm gonna eat grass or whatever we just come out saying dang like what is what the hell is going on i have no idea man like and then we're just presented with all these things and we ended up we end up making this model in our in our minds that this is normal and this is what's going on and really it's just what we're sensing at the current point in time and you could be born anywhere else and you could be sensing entirely different phenomena that's on, along the general lines but it's entirely different meals it's entirely different intake or cultural habits right because like at the end of the day that's just everything that we're taught that's also what makes human consciousness really complex is that we're taught everything we know so when it comes to the whole concepts of right and wrong we only know so much that we view to be right and wrong you know we only see how it's impacting others, right? Like how another is impacted determines our conclusion of what is right and wrong, you know? Versus us just being born with some sort of moral compass. Like that doesn't happen anywhere you go. Like you could be born around people whom are fighting other people and then that's normal, right? It's normal for people, human beings to kill each other. Well, then you go into anywhere else and you're like, oh my God, that's not normal at all. Nobody here is doing that. That's like the most ostracized thing around here, you know? But it's just because of culture, right? Because of how we're taught and how we're brought up. And I think it would be kind of interesting if we as animals were just born knowing a little more, you know? But so far, in my opinion, I don't think we've had any way to actually prove like genetic memory isn't like, oh, like you were born just knowing this certain thing, right? 
like because in my opinion that that's that's that that would be some evidence of genetic memory right like a deer just knows how to walk right. but it's also like it's not like it's not surrounded by people already standing and it's perspective right it's like it could just be born and in its perspective it's just learning i have to stand up because everything that looks somewhat remotely like me is already on all fours you know that could just be the case because we don't really know and we can't determine the consciousness of other allied forms but in my opinion when you observe them it appears as if they already know what they're doing and it appears we really don't know what we're doing like and i think it's kind of uncomfortable or unnerving to know that like that, that there's other life form that we view to be lesser of intelligence yet it knows so much more than we do from the very beginning it already knows what to do like i've, I've been thinking about this for quite a while now like it seems as if this entire life that we're given it seems as if we're just realizing throughout this period of time how complex the psychical and subjective aspects of life actually is because like like imagine being like one or two years old and having some sort of consciousness but now you're 17 and you don't remember anything and it kind of like makes me think this whole broadcasting thing right like how many how much are we actually projecting our own reality through our own selves all the time because it's like you know when we meet someone it's you know and like when we like a person it's because we recognize parts of ourselves in them that seem you know kind of like oh yeah I, either i admire that or it's the same thing as me that this person has or the same ambition or whatever you know and it seems as if that is what it attracts us. it's as if you're always even within language and like reality and experience you're always constructing your own projected reality like everything that you talk about everything that you identify in your environment like even when we go out on buses and stuff right like this is what i call it like you know aesthetic appreciation or like where, where you're just like in a bus and you're just looking outside the window but you choose to focus on only certain person or certain things or you just see it as, as as you go, but you're always, you know, kind of focused towards this one thing, you know, and this one thing is only the, the thing that, you know, you are projecting yourself to focus on. So like, you know, okay, maybe if I'm passing through, let's say, you know, a city full of amazing skyscrapers. So yeah, skyscraper is what fascinates me or something like that. Or I see some unique element that I've never, you know, like really known within myself that I, you know, okay, wow, that particular thing, but why did I not look at the person who was walking by? You know, th th these are, you know, kind of like the questions that make you baffle. Like there's so much happening around you, but you only tend to choose focus you know, pay attention to specific things. And it is because you're always constructing your own projected reality. Like, you know, this process yeah. of individuation that Jung talks about, that you go through stages of life, that you might have a midlife crisis when you're 30, you know, it's all like you're, by the end of, you know, our lifetime, we only get to realize most of ourselves. Then the, you know, like mm -hmm. most of our own experience what our own subjective experience in relation to our environment so we actually end up knowing more about us than the universe that we're trying to like know so regular you're, you're you know you're going away from the main question like why are you here okay you made it all the way to 70 now what you know like all you yeah. have at that point is just this memory or this trippy you know like information about you interacting with external environments not even like anything crazy external it's like, you know, data about your own self and, you know, you're just at this subjective entity who is, you know, for some reason on this, you know, amazing, interesting environment and is continuously interacting with it. Our own nature is, you know, self-generating and self-manifesting. We're creating, we're, we're you know, autopoetic nature. So we're always self-generating, self-manifesting living systems, right? But at the same time, it's like, throughout this whole, you know, intention of kind of figuring out the functionalities of the way our environment works, we end up actually analyzing through this functionality of the environment, our own functionings, but at a very, very metaphysical and unconscious level, because we're always so focused on what is in front of us that we never see what's actually going on. You know, it's kind of like the cause and effect thing. Like, you know, we, we, we think about the effect so much that we, we stray away from the cause or, or, you know, our own selves. So it seems as if we're always projecting it, like even within languages, you know, like how, the things that we talk about someone else, let's say, you know, it's most of the times we're talking about our own selves or the things that we would find 
you know, disturbing or insecure or any of that. And then we talk about the other person the same way, but it's usually you who's going through that stuff that is projecting. So, you know, this whole projection thing is actually what in the end, like is constructing our own framework of this environment. Like why do some people want to be scientists or biologists or like, you know, like school whatever, who knows? Because they're attracted to it because that's, you know, that's what they want to construct their own reality as. So, you know, the question comes, what is even objective when we're such subjective beings going through such subjective phenomenological experience and we don't know anything about, you know, this quote unquote objective that we're in. What we're trying to do is like, in order to understand the objective, we're understanding the objective, but through subjectivity. So in turn, what's happening is we're actually understanding the subjectivity. And so what is even psychometrics or any of that? It takes years, dude. It takes years for anyone to understand, oh, this might be wrong with this person. This person might have bipolar. Yeah, maybe schizophrenia, it's easy to understand, but like things like that takes years. Because like you're kind of trying to understand the behavior of patterns, it's never easy. But at the same time, who isn't, you know, psychopathologically unaligned? Because we're so diverse, you know. So it's it's kind of crazy. I feel like you know, like this entire course of our life is just under us understanding us and the experience, but through us, you know. So it's always very trippy to imagine. Yeah. Have you heard of Robert Robert Anton Wilson? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so Robert Anton Wilson, right, he, he's one of my heroes, although he was a really weird eccentric guy, a really weird guy. Um, Robert Anton Wilson was awesome because Robert Anton Wilson had polio, and he wasn't able to walk, but he is the one who preached the whole concept of reality tunnels, and how we're constantly formulating our own personal reality tunnel. It's like as if it's a dome that sits above us, right? And we're in this half a bubble and we're constantly roaming around, right? And what's within our reality tunnel is subjective and what we put there, right? Like we're constantly filtering all the input that, that we get to us. And we're constructing this tunnel of how, how our reality should look, as you're saying, the subjective. Well, Robert Anton Wilson was one, probably one of, the first, one of the first few people to have proved how his subjective reality can interact with the objective one because he was not able to walk because he had polio, but through the act of pro metaprogramming, as he called it, self metaprogramming, he was able to program into his reality tunnel that he'll be able to walk again. And for a period of time, he was able to get himself to walk all on his own by himself. Eventually it stopped, but he was able to do it. And he actually achieved it. And after he did it the first time, he would always tell everyone, I don't know when I'm going to do it again, but you know what? I'm going to walk again. I will walk again, and I will. And he did it. It's just so nuts to me to think that it was achievable, right? Because as far as we know it, like, you shouldn't have been able to walk. He should have never been able to walk again the moment he was told, you can't walk. But then he did it, right? And he did it through his own literal subjective self-metaprogramming in order to tell himself and condition himself that he will be able to walk again, and he will be capable of doing this, and then he did it. And even though it wasn't that long, it's still profound enough to say that he was able to fight polio enough to walk when he was guaranteed for the rest of his life to never be able to stand on his own feet again. And that, now that's like only one subjective case, right? That's one subjective experience for interaction with objectivity. But it's still profound enough for me to say that I feel like metaprogramming has, has, some, has some basis, you know? Enough that I feel like it could interact with the reality Especially because when it comes to subjectivity, right, we, for instance, you could look at a tree and you could say, I don't like those limbs, those, those limbs on that tree. What if I cut it, you know, and made it look like this? It would look like this. And you have this image in your mind of how the hedges or how that tree might look if you bucked the limbs off of it. So what do you do? You go up and you cut that tree and you interact with it. Now you've just subjectively changed this other living organism in objective reality to look the way you subjectively wanted it to, right? Mm -hmm. And it was all because you decided to take action. And now when it comes to like the hardcore bit of science, you could say, well, because of how the eyes or the cameras in your that are your eyes work, you very well could just be projecting that tree into reality. And that tree is not really there, right? 
which in my opinion is like a really tough one to accept, especially seeing how we can all go up to this tree and say, yeah, I can, I can knock on that. It's like physically there. I think it's there, right? Almost everybody you were just like have go up to that tree would tell you that that's a tree, dude, you know, but scientifically we'll just say, oh, you're projecting your own inter internal reality. None of those trees are actually there. Just like for instance, your eyes are perceiving the electromagnetic frequencies of color and every color you've ever experienced has never actually been there. All colors have always been subjective. So there is no color, right? It's the same thing, right? But it's like, at the end of the day, we're all just gonna say, I mean, I'm pretty sure there's this short list of colors guy, like they're around and you can look at them, they're everywhere. You know, now everybody, there are people who are colorblind, right? And that, that's where you further get the whole like, oh, color is not real because it's subjective, right? Because our, our eyes are receiving the electromagnetic frequencies that is that particular color and we're computing it, right? And thus determining it to be a particular color. That's why some people that won't see the same color, they might see maroon as like, you know, say pink, right? Something different, just very different. Although we're like, oh, that's, that's an obviously maroon red, right? They'll be like, oh, that's pink, if not purple. Well, they're just not seeing it the same. Now, the question is, is that color there, right? And are we just not able to see it because that person's seeing it, right? Or are all colors subjective because we don't all agree on this consensus, right? That kind of goes back to the whole AI thing and like the whole giving us an uh, atomic form, which is entirely mechanical, right? That's to say that like, oh, we're all supposed to be the same. Otherwise, reality is not real. And that, that, that makes it all the more like confusing, right? Because that's to say, well, if we all don't have the same camera in our eyes, then none of reality is real and that everything is subjective. Although we can all see that that tree is there despite us all perceiving different colors on the tree, right? In my opinion, I think a lot of objective reality is there. Um, and that's just, that's just me, but I do think most of it is subjective. How we perceive it is most certainly subjective. Like some people could say that tree's not there at all, but you know, how are you to, to, to how are you to determine that that person is actually perceiving that tree? What are you going to do? Hook them up to a polygraph test and be like, "Can you see the tree now?" You know what I mean? Like, what what's really determining whether or not that person's seeing that tree? Aside from them just having a consensus, right? It's just like, I think there's a little bit more objectivity to our subjective realities. You know, it's just, it just seems that way. Because if things were ultimately subjective, then it's like, we would be able to claim the world however we'd like it, but we can't. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can say that subjectivity is like filtering system, right? Like, yeah. we're always like, there's obviously an objective reality. So let's just imagine like a, you know, like a smartphone and like we were using a filter. But we're also capturing something, right? So yeah. To be there, the objective reality is on there, and the subjective reality is basically putting colors and and structure and, and and stuff like that onto it. So it just makes you realize that even within like human perception, it's it's you know it's literally your imagination, which overpowers the the thing that you're perceiving, because perception is usually objective in nature. It is actually the imagination and how we're taking the data, like how we're actually encoding it. You know, the very process of just perceiving and, and taking in the data, that one nanosecond is literally subjectivity because we're basically filtering, like we, we take in data, but we're only trying to identify the subjective essence of it, or we're just programmed that way, you know, it's our meta programming, as you said. So it's like, you know, we're always, um, in this weird environment when we have these you know crazy subjective experiences but it's usually like a filtering system it's like we're encoding things onto our external environment and that's where you know complexity comes in about human beings like how do communities form how is there you know still some sort of consensus when we as humans have ultimate free will you know this entire free will argument i feel like you only have to you know, question your own free will when you've entered a social contract, right? So like when we're born, we're completely free. Like we don't even have our own like memories from being two or one, complete memories. You know, there might be some trauma that we might be able to, you know, recall, but not, you know, in entirety. And 
that's complex. Then we, you know, move on to this other teenage adolescence years when our bodies are changing. So things are usually very complex. But how 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 is this complexity, you know, like realized? It's it's usually when we're born, we're free. Then as soon as we surpass the age of three or four and we're, you know, entering social dynamics like school, it's like we're entering the social contract. We're signing to be the members of this particular society. That's when we question our free will because now our free will is adjusting to the free will of others. So, you know, this cutting down of, you know, choices and options and beliefs, that's when we actually question free will because we as humans are completely free individuals. We can think of X, Y, Z, you know, that's, um, I remember once I was reading this old ancient Indian like stories about kings and queens. And there was apparently this one king uh, you know, who, uh, who uh, I think got conquered by uh, the, the other army and he was by his own. And he said this one thing, you can play with my body, you can kill me, you can cut off my arms, but you can never operate here. You can never make me say the things that you want me to say right now, because it's all, you know, in the mind that kind of like tells you how complex your mind really is and powerful about everything. And like, it yeah. makes you realize that you can, you can take a person, you can, you know, torture them in any way possible, but you really cannot change their mind or their subjectivity because it's just really unique to them. And, you know, that's also something complex. Like there's so many interesting things happening and, and it's crazy how we don't tend to question this kind of stuff. Like these are the more important questions. Like how does this, all this dynamic within our society actually work? And like, what is this complexity? You know, we're like, we always, you know, are angry about things happening around us, but it's because literally we signed up to be in this social contract. Like, you know, if a society has to function and, and you know, achieve things, it has to have a consensus, right? And if the consensus is there, it means literally X amount of people are agreeing to one thing. They have to perceive, you know, this one thing as the ultimate thing, right? That's why they're concluding this. But at the same time, then we see individuals who are completely out of it in the society, you know, are probably in jails and doing stuff. It's because they don't realize the value of the social contract. They don't realize that they've actually entered a social contract. You know, like it's it's such a it's such a weird thing with the free will argument or or just like existing within a community because it's always filtered. It's either filtered towards you know the social guidelines upon which this consensus is reached and upon which the society exists, or you know it's you being by your own self, you know you know experiencing reality on your own as a quote unquote anarchist, as people would say. But it's literally yeah. your voice always, like you know, like I had a uh, Creon Levitt on yesterday, and he talked about how you know this is myth of Sisyphus which is basically, you know, the, that Sisyphus was cursed by Zeus to go to hell and roll the stone over a mountain all the time for eternity, you know, that, that was his curse. So within that kind of philosophy, it's like, oh, you know, life is absurd. We're always doing the same thing, you know, the mundane things in life. That was the philosophy behind it. But he said like, you know, but maybe let's just look at it from a different angle. He's rolling the stone but he does have the free will to take up all the four solid ones and pull it all the way up. But he's not doing that. He's just rolling the stone, you know, all the time. He's, you know, absent to the thought that this could also be done, that this is within the reach, that we always in our head have the option. Like there's always options. It's just, we don't take it. And then we, you know, somehow blame or projection onto our own reality, where it's usually us. You know, that's, that, that's what I think most of the problems we have, psychological or anything, it usually comes down to, it's either we have to adjust our behavior or we have to, you know, like kind of push ourselves back from someone, you know, like it's always that, yeah. but we always have the choice within this complexity, which is baffling. I don't know. Which is really baffling. Social contracts are definitely pretty real within colonies. And I say that because like, in my perspective of reality, it's like, any society you enter, it doesn't really matter what you do. Nobody cares what job you do or what role you play. We just care that you contribute to others and that you're contributing to the colony as a whole. That's all, that's all anybody ever cares about. Because like when you think about it, with the type of life we have, we're only born because of other colonies. Because there was a colony of people, we get to exist. Well, 
with that being said, it's particularly selfish to just say, well, I'm just going to leave this place and I'm going to go do absolutely whatever I want because that's all I want to do, right? Because it's like you're as a social creature, you're going to leave, you're going to go, you're going to think you have all this freedom in the world. And then you're going to say, damn, now I don't have all these conveniences and all these things. You know, I don't have all these others who know all this other information which could contribute to me in my hands. You know, I'd have to use my hands to contribute to them if I want their assistance, them knowing other things, you know, whether it comes to like automotive or travel or whatever, you know, you're going to need others. That's that's like the essence of it, right? The essence of social contract. You need others. No matter where you go, you're going to need another. <laughs> like you and I subjective being like we cannot like even though we try to exist all by our, our own at yeah. some point our mind is going to be having this urge to interact with the other right and that's when we enter the social contract is when we realize that we have to coexist like we need some other entity kind of like yeah. in order to exist and that's you know that's what's crazy about childhood right like people say that you're more um in psychology you have this whole conception that the child is more attracted towards the mother, which is this audible complex automatically, that, that, that the child is born in this context, there's a father and there's a mother. He observes that the father is attracted to the mother, that the mother is this you know, entire object of desire, and that we're always after her. So for three or four years of our life, all we know is our like two, three people in our family, which is literally a mother and father, and, and mm -hmm. it's automatically happening in our reality and we don't really pay that much attention to. But even then, we're focused on this other subjective entity, right? Like our mom. Like there's always this particular need. Like we, even if a person, like I don't think a baby can survive by itself, right? Like no, it can't. There's no way. They they need fed, bro. They'll die. <laughs> like I said, we as animals, we're not just born knowing what we can eat. You know, we're not born capable of digesting grass even. Like no joke. Like we don't have the digestive enzymes for like anything aside from milk. For like ever dude we're just pretty weak creatures in the beginning but you know we all get relatively strong you know it's just how it works yeah you know? in my opinion it doesn't really matter and this is a little off topic but it's relative it doesn't really matter what substance anybody uses you know and and that's a really broad statement i'm on now that being said i don't think people should do things which deteriorate their body at all i think we should take substances which benefit our body really important because we're trying to become a better species and a better wholesome race right we're all got to get better we all got to improve and if we're all just deteriorating de de deteriorating then we're not particularly improving now are we so i don't think it matters what substance what you do you could sit there and waste away for a long period of time without realizing you haven't been living right like I, for instance, have taken DMT way too many times, in my opinion. Now, there's this, there's a, as if, uh, as a gentleman, I can't remember his name, but he wrote this book called DMT in My Occult Mind. And I believe he's taken DMT like over 500 times or something like that. Really, really ridiculous, you know? And, I, and I'm over here, here thinking like 140, 150, that's, that's well more than enough, you know? In my opinion, at, at, at maybe 30 or 40 times, you, you probably had DMT too many times. That's just my opinion. And some people could say, oh, you can't have DMT too many times. And that's what I thought too. But when you end up spending hours and hours and hours extracting things, so you could sit there for hours and hours and hours partaking in things, you lose a lot of time on your feet and you deteriorate a lot more than what you think you will, even if you're taking safe psychoactive substances. If you're not using it, you're going to lose it, right? That's the whole thing about the body. If you're not using it, you're going to lose it all the time. So what, when I came out of one of my last DMT experiences, I was so infatuated by the fact that we don't just look at a doorway and say, wow, you see the light coming from the other side of that doorway? I wonder what's on the other side of that. We just think, oh, there's a fucking door there, right? We don't care about it. We don't view it as wow, I'm in a space. I'm literally in a space. I'm moving through space right now. I could go through portals in this space, you know, although we just call them doorways. It really is a portal. You're going into a different realm, a different Euclidean space. Even if someone thinks they feel extraordinarily healthy, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with evaluating health. I don't think there's, I don't think anybody needs to just change their diet. I think it's just observing what it is you put in yourself, which creates and fuels your consciousness. And then 
trying to articulate your being throughout space based off how your consciousness is fueled. And you'll find you act differently based off what it is you've eaten and how you respond to different physical activities is entirely different based off what, what it is you've eaten. And that wasn't something I really looked into until like I changed my diet again. And like when I were to go just do an activity, like take a hike, for instance, it just feel dramatically different. I feel like us social creatures, we don't care about ourselves, yeah. you know, like. Yeah, I feel like, you know, kind of like, that's also another complexity, right? It's kind of like, you can compare, you know, like what we eat uh, is who we are. or just like this eating component that, that we eat food and somehow certain kind of food goes certain level with a particular body type, right? So it's mm -hmm. this weird thing that a certain food is particularly good for a certain person. Again, another complexity within subjectivity. It's kind of like, you know, like how different technological things has, like, let's say this phone has a particular uh, charging port and a particular frequency at, it, at which this phone charges or which this laptop charges or anything. It, it has a particular frequency, particular amount of electricity going through the wire for it to be a particular, you know, to reach a particular level of charging, right? So it, yeah. if we can compare ourselves to that, we you know, like as humans, we only take certain foods as, as subjective beings that are subjective to ourselves. Like some people are really good at being vegetarian. Well, as you see, like some people would go on a vegan diet and their body would completely collapse. And you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of comparable to psychoactive substances. Like why is that we are attracted to certain uh, compounds or we like them is because they go well with our body, right? Like I've seen mm -hmm. people talk so much shit about cannabis smoking because they think that they, it will land them on couches. Whereas it's like, on the other hand, I'm a high functioning stoner, you know? Like I could be smoking X amount of stuff and be cognitively aware, but how does that, yeah. you know? Like it's a yeah. kind of charging a particular kind of metaphysical stuff happening here that makes me, you know, like, like this compound more, my body just goes well with it. Like I don't have any yeah. other side of it. It's it's crazy. It's like another another um, complexity entirely to think to think about. Like what goes well with you, and why does it go well with you? Most importantly, yeah. yeah. I I find people who have a tough time with alcohol typically seem to respond particularly well to cannabis. And my hypothesis on that is is similar to Terence McKenna. It's it's the fact that. THC or tetrahydrochloride is basically like hydrochloric alcohol, right? Because it has this GABA effect, right? And alcohol has a GABA response as well. And I think what it is, is that with our cannabinoid receptors, it's like as if it's the only, it, it's, it is as if it's the only clean version of alcohol, so to speak, right? Because alcohol has, alcohol has these, some mild benefits, extraordinarily mild, like as an like nothing as in certain types of alcohol induce your own endogenous GHB production, which is can be good if you're trying to sleep and if you're trying to like grow a little bit, you know, or heal a little faster, but it depends on the quantity, right? Because it's still detrimental to, to your liver and your kidneys, all sorts of your organs, because it's a literal poison. And that's why it's burning as it goes down. Well, any, well, well for instance, if whether you eat it or smoke it, right? When it comes to THC, it's not the same. It's a cleaner effect right? Our body has a positive response to it, but there are still people who don't have a positive response to it, which is really astounding. I don't know if you've ever seen it happen. I have. It is very overwhelming because you don't know what you could do for that person. Like I have a, I have a uncle in the family. He has PTSD. So I was trying to get him behind the whole concept of cannabis, right? And he got his medical card and everything. And like he tried it and he did not have a, a, a particularly good response to it. I'm a, and it, it was really astounding because in extraordinarily small doses, it's, he's, he's fine. He's completely okay. He can function. But if he takes like, say a standard toke or two, right. As if he were a normal person and he becomes extraordinarily ill-functional. It's like he gets spontaneously green sick. Like he just has to go outside and puke and he'll have hot flashes and everything. And we don't know what it is. We have no idea. We can't determine what it is or why he has this response. And I've, for instance, seen people like, you know, take alcohol and like their immediate reaction is hot flash. I have to go outside and puke. 
well, it's kind of strange how they're like so similar, you know, as if as if this person had just taken a mass to, to their nervous system or to their cannabinoid system, at least it's as if they had taken a massive dose of some type of alcohol and now they can't process it. Whereas, you know, for instance, like, like a smaller dose would have done virtually nothing. And I think it's kind of like important that we look at that because it's like, I think alcohol in itself has a, like a lot of problems. And I think there's way too much alcoholism going on. And I don't, and although you, if for instance, someone with an addictive personality could be addicted to any substance, it doesn't matter if the, if the substance is non-addictive or not, as we know, medically speaking. That being said, cannabis is still a non-addictive substance. And in my opinion, would still serve as a better substitute to alcohol. Now, the problem is we're just never going to get rid of alcohol because of people's response to it and how much they like it. And also the fact that we've been taking it over such a period of time, thus changing the physiological response to the alcohol. And what I think is kind of fascinating about alcohol is that for like the longest period of time, we just took alcohol like it was the most casual thing. Like we like, like made mead and everything all throughout culture, just because that's what we drank, you know? And what was really weird is that for, for such a period of time, it's like we didn't know boiling our water would make it clean, right? Like we didn't actually know boiling our water would clean it. So what we did is we made fucking alcohol out of everything, you know, like fermented piss and everything, made alcohol out of it. And then we just drank that for like a long period of time, which is to me like, what? Like you're telling me we didn't just stop and say, what if we boil the water? You know, what if we do that? Like we never thought about it until we figured it out. And now we don't just drink that. We drink water like we should, like we should have been drinking water this whole time. And it's like, to me, I, I feel like one of our original sources of finding alcohol had to have been inside of fermented fruits. And what makes me say that is because certain fruits, uh, when they're fermented, are just left on the ground and their sugars have gone too complex for such a period of time and they've ripened for too long. They create GHB. They literally make like this GHB like alcohol substance inside the fruit. So if you're to eat enough of this semi rotten fruit, right? you get into this state of intoxication, which has a strong GABA response and is very alcohol-like, right? So it's like, I think that's where we first found it, you know? And then we thought, well, dang, you know, that's that's pretty nice. You know, we should probably try to figure out a way to like get this around, you know? Because it's like, it seems like you can only get it from all the nastiest of fruit. We don't always want to eat nasty fruit, you know what I mean? And I think it's just like, like when you look in the drug history, it, it, it goes so far back, like, Humans are such strange and somewhat grungy creatures that we are to say that like, oh yeah, we found some rotted fruit on the ground and it's good, bro. You want to try some? You know, it's delicious. You know, that's kind of gross to me. And the fact that we're all like, oh yeah, we can't drink the water because every time we drink the water, somebody gets sick and fucking dies. Can't just drink out of the creek. So, I mean, damn, we, we, we make a drink out of it all. And yeah, you know, now that we all have drinks, we can drink, you know? But it's like, it's got, and I think really what it is, is that it's, like, it's got such a mild alcohol content. It's just, we were like somewhat sterilizing or sanitizing the water, you know, whatever fluid was in there enough for us to get some level of hydration from it. But when you look at it, right, it's like, we're still just severely dehydrating ourselves all throughout history because alcohol doesn't hydrate you, it dehydrates you, you know? So it's like, we might, we might have gotten some clean fluid, but it wasn't very clean or pure, so, and I'm still just astounded to think that like some cultures could find out really quickly you could boil water. <laughs> like in most of them, we won't find that out at all for a long period of time.